Welcome everyone. We're excited to have you here today for our um, Farm Arts by Talks virtual webinar series. And thanks for joining us. My name is Meredith Chagudis. I'm the Senior Director of Development in MSU's College of Communication Arts and Sciences, a college devoted to storytelling and the way we communicate and connect. So just a little bit of background, as MSU moved to online instruction this spring, we also watched our alumni quickly adapt and pivot in their industries, and we discovered that people are quite interested in some of the behind the scenes aspects of different commerce side careers during this time. So that spawned this webinar series about media and communication careers pivoting in the pandemic, and which leads us to today's commerce side talk with a spotlight on the beverage industry. So we're excited to be able to provide this opportunity and conversation. Um, and thanks so much for the questions submitted in advance. So attendees, you will note that your microphone is muted and your camera is off, but we encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A function in the webinar, and we will moderate that as we go. And also please make sure you tag us today on your social media with hashtag talks. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our host for the hour. Professor Andy Corner has been a professor of practice in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations for I think nearly 15 years now. Prior to joining faculty at MSU, Andy was in um, senior marketing and communication roles with the Rossman Group and also Ingham Regional Medical Center locally. And most importantly, as a two-time alum of the college with his bachelor's in communications and master's in public relations and is a 2014 recipient of the college's Faculty Impact Award. So Andy is a very skilled moderator, frequent host for a lot of alumni in his class. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him to introduce our esteemed alumni panel. Welcome everyone, and here you go, Andy. Thanks, Meredith. That was an overly glowing introduction. Uh, welcome to everybody who's online today. We appreciate having you uh, tuned in with us today. And as Meredith said, it's my privilege to moderate this third installment of Pivoting in the Pandemic. You probably see me looking to the, to the side a lot. That's because a pivot I had to make today is my uh, printer ran out of toner. So I'm looking at another computer screen for my notes. I apologize for that in advance. But again, it is my privilege to moderate today's session on the beverage industry. We have three distinguished alumni with us today. And they're eager to share their thoughts about uh, the beverage industry and how the adaption has been under the new normal and answer your questions. So I'll begin with some introductions, but let me remind you, as Meredith said, we've got the Q&A chat function open, so feel free to fill it up with your questions and we'll get them in front of our panelists. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the panel and we'll go in alphabetical order, starting with Jim Cantor, Chief Commercial Officer for Sprecher Brewing Company in Wisconsin. Jim's an experienced leader with skills in consumer products, sales, commercial operation, management, and account management. In addition to his role at Sprecher, he's active in his community as chairman of the board of the Wisconsin Center District and board member of Visit Milwaukee and Discovery World. And on top of his advertising degree from MSU, Jim has an MBA focused in international marketing and finance from DePaul University. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Andy. And thank you for being here. Our second uh, panelist is John Parks, Executive Vice President of Bacheras Brothers Coffee Company in Detroit. John's an accomplished coffee sales executive with more than three decades of experience focused on contract packaging for distributors in a variety of sectors at the regional and national levels. He moves more than 1 million pounds of coffee every year. That's pretty impressive. And he's, he's also launched a number of startups including a martial arts center and a nonprofit charity that works to help foster children. Thank you, John, and welcome. Thank you. And our third panelist is Adam Warrington. Adam is Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility for Anheuser-Busch. Anheuser-Busch, as we know, is based in St. Louis, but Adam actually works out of New York City, and he leads several CSR programs for America's leading brewer. His team is responsible for local and national initiatives, including the company's longstanding emergency drinking water program that delivers canned water to areas hit by natural disasters. Other initiatives include the Drink Wiser Responsible Drinking Campaign and the company's 2025 sustainability goals. Adam has a master's degree in mass communication from the University of Florida on top of his bachelor's in history from MSU. 
So welcome to all three of our panelists. And I've got some questions teed up, as I said, but remember, uh, audience, the Q&A function is available. It's live and ready for your questions, so send them our way, and we'll get them in front of our guests. But let me begin with Adam, because it just so happens that I was in Adam's office during the last hours of the old normal. I had a chance to meet him March 4th, I think it was, at his office in Manhattan. So let me ask you, Adam, um, how do you define what the new normal is for you? Well, Andy, thanks for having me. Go green, appreciate Go being wide. here. <laughs> a lot's happened uh, the last three months since uh, we had a chance to meet and, and bring some students into to our office in Manhattan. Yeah, the new normal, um, you know, it's really interesting. Just thinking back three months, you know, at that point, uh, I and the team I get to lead was, was focused on our plans for the year, which tied to our emergency drinking water program, raising awareness for that, working to deliver more cans to those who need, uh, working in responsible drinking initiatives, frankly, working on a lot of sustainability initiatives. All that work has taken a backseat. It hasn't diminished in importance, but it's diminished in terms of priorities. And of course, that's all tied to, to COVID-19. On March 4th, I personally knew very little about hand sanitizer. Um, today, we've now delivered more than 500,000 eight ounce bottles of hand sanitizer uh, across the country, working primarily with the Red Cross and blood drives are facilitating, but state emergency agencies. So that's at the direction of uh, elected officials uh, across the country. Um, we've worked with the Red Cross. We've now helped facilitate more than 60 blood drives using our sports teams partnerships. So arenas, stadiums have space where you can socially distance safely to give blood. They can facilitate that through online enrollment. So we tapped into our relationships and resources, some dollars we we're able to give the Red Cross proactively um, to help facilitate that. Again, something that on March 4th was absolutely not on my mind. So the new normal has been about really pivoting and focusing on community support initiatives that make sense, I think, to Anheuser-Busch, what we stand for and what our capabilities can do versus maybe trying to boil the ocean, do some things that yes, could make an impact, but would make sense to our business. Hmm. Right. John, let me ask you the same question. Uh, how do you define the new normal? Well, for us, we've had to, over the years, and I, again, we're a over a hundred year old company, we've had to reinvent ourselves quite a few times. Um, this, and for this particular moment in history, where we have been primarily a supplier to the restaurant trade, as well as to the vending, coffee service, corporate dining, uh, you know, sectors that all of that has really been shut down. And so really taking a look at where people are consuming the product, uh, frankly, it's been at home. And that has not been a, a, an area that we have focused on up to this point. But our new normal is to be, frankly, to be looking at other ways that we can actually reach the, the end user. The end user is certainly not giving up coffee. It certainly is a legally addictive product, if you will. and. Uh, they're still drinking coffee. They're just not drinking it where we had historically uh, been supplying you know, those channels. And so for us, our new normal is to, because we are, you know, a, a we're considered a mid-sized roaster, but we're very flexible. We can pivot very quickly. We're looking at new ways to produce our product and get it to the end user. That's our new normal. Excellent. And Jim, how about you? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Great input. But as we were talking earlier, I think, you know, it, it forces you to think a little bit differently and it forces you to kind of become a little scrappier. As we've looked at our business, we're uniquely positioned in that we have soda as well as beer. And then we have a retail trade as well as doing tours here. So it's really kind of impacted our business where we've had no tours coming through at all, zero dollars of revenue. But how do we actually start supporting uh, things and doing different things when the on-premise environment, the bars and restaurants and those partners that we have there to help elevate their businesses, whether it's curbside delivery and doing some packaging um, things with them or bundled deals with them. Um, as we continue to look forward and, and we think food safety, food security, beverage safety, beverage security is gonna be a big thing as well. So rather than um, 52 lines of draft beer in an account, how do we bring things have disposable cups to them or bottles or cans? And that ties in probably with some of the stuff you're probably working with Adam too, with the corporate and social responsibility to make sure we all have the right clean footprint too. So these things start, you know, working through this and how do you balance all of it out? But I think safety and security through the supply chain will be a big thing and prepackaged products uh, that we've been talking with our, our retail partners about has been a big thing. Excellent. So John, you are, are a supplier to uh, vendors then. You, Correct. 
So what ha can you be more specific about what we've actually done to try and overcome that? Well, uh, I, I sell, because frankly, very few people can save a Cheris. Uh, we don't uh, do a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of retail coffee at this point in time, at least not under our logo. Um, the, in terms of you know, how we're, the distributors that we have right now, they supply the really corporate America. If you were to, you know, perhaps uh, gentlemen, uh, Jim and Adam, you know, and, and certainly Andy, in your office that, that you may have a coffee maker there. Somebody has to bring that, somebody has to supply that. I supply the people that supply the companies throughout America. And now we're selling in a little over 40 states, I believe. And the reality is that they have shut down. And because of that, they're slowly turning back on throughout the, uh, throughout the country. But people are drinking coffee differently. They're looking at how are they going to be consuming the coffee differently at their places of work. And it's a, you know, oftentimes people don't want to necessarily touch the coffee maker, the vending machine, the stack of cups, whatever it might be. So there has been a, uh, and it's not, it's, it's a concern for me. It's not, it, it's really, it's a problem for the distributors that they have to figure out. But how are we going to give the end user, the customer, the employee, uh, a, the opportunity to, to, to continue drinking uh, the coffees? So. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge that we have at this point in time. That's the reason why as, that, and as companies are coming back online that they are, they may actually, a lot of them are talking about leaving a, some of their, or a portion of their employees at home working right. remotely. And as that happens, certainly then, at least in the channels that we have to date, fewer people will be drinking coffee in the workplace. And so our challenge is how do we get that coffee to them at home? So really exploiting the online presence, the retail market, it is a, uh, it takes, there is time that is involved with that, but um, it's something that we are in the process of doing right now. Excellent, well, we wish you luck with that. Adam, let me ask you if I could, what values of Anheuser-Busch's Better World platform have you pulled from to address the changes brought about by the pandemic? Yeah, so our, our corporate dream is bringing people together for a better world, right? So internally, we, we refer to corporate social responsibility as, as better world. You know, so typically, when you think about bringing people together, as, as Jim well knows, that could be over a beer. And typically, that means going somewhere to have a beer. It might be to a brew pub, it might be to a bar, it might be at a sporting event where you can sell and distribute beer. Taking that away and now in this you know remote virtual environment, much like we're having right now, is how do you still bring people together? You know, one thing we've done is we've worked with our sports marketing team and they've done a lot of at-home music series. So artists we have relationships with doing a concert brought to you by Bud Light, brought to you by Michelob Ultra, but we make sure we work to make sure there's always a charitable component with that as well. So mm -hmm. the people watching are so inclined, they can give to a cause that we and as Bush kind of believe in. So our main partner throughout the crisis has been the American Red Cross. They have a desperate need for funds, as, as they always do. You know, they're being asked to do even more now than the typical work that they do, um, which has always been focused on disaster relief. This is a different kind of disaster, of course, being a pandemic. When, you know, they reached out to us in March and, and told us in the course of a week, they had more than 7,000 blood drives across the country canceled. Very simple mm -hmm. reason, offices were closed. So places where many of us work, couldn't host a blood drive because we couldn't even go into the office, let alone feel comfortable safely giving blood. So they've had to pivot very quickly. So we work to try to entertain people in this new normal at home while still tying into our Better World platform and, and values. And um, again, we're bringing people together in a little different way right now. Very good. Question for uh, Jim now and Adam as well. Uh, we've seen stories about increased alcohol consumption in the past few months probably related to being forward at home. Not that I have any experience with that. Uh, how, what impact have you seen as a result of that, if any? And what are, you, what are your expectations going forward? Yeah, um, I, Adam or me or you want to- Please, Jeff, go ahead. Adam? Please start. Uh, yeah, well, I think what we have seen is certainly the off-premise as we define in our industry has been very active. It's been up a lot. And those are the grocery stores or the big box retailers um, that, that sell a lot of Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, other big packages, 30 packs of products um, of cans. We're seeing 
that stock up occasion where people are actually coming to the store once a week or every other week rather than every other day and picking up a six pack. So that shift certainly in that class of trade has been very interesting to watch and you got, it impacts your supply chain. It impacts um, your can uh, packages and how you're getting those cans. Um, this convenience store class of trade has actually been hit pretty hard. Not many people, as many people going to the office as John said about you know employees not being there and stopping in and getting that single serve that they do once a day at the end of the day uh, or something like that you know there's less gas consumption so people aren't even going to the gas stations and grocery stores but the biggest impact that we have certainly seen is that on-premise class of trade which has been uh, slow to know uh, at all and I think in, within our industry it's about 25 to 30 percent of the industry business so the shift in where people are consuming is happening, but the total, I would say, um, you know, the Nielsen reads and the IRI reads say packages and, and consumption is way up. But overall, I would say the, um, the category is relatively stagnant or flat, and I think it causes some supply chain backups on things like um, uh, half barrels yeah, within, you know, I, and Adam, you see it too, where you have all your venues, whether it's uh, baseball stadiums or football stadiums or whatever, that's just not there. And you had to pre-order a lot of that stuff in advance. So it causes some backups uh, within the supply chain. And I think we're all kind of struggling through and dealing with how we work with our distributor partners and our retail partners as well. So Adam, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, no, just to build off that, as, as, as Jim, as you referenced, you know, each brewer has a very different mix in terms of their on and off premise business. So, you know, some certainly skew much higher on premise and that's been more of a struggle or, or they're adapting their sales method. You know, from our side, and then Andy, to your question, you know, as you can imagine, we look at a lot of data, we've been looking at a lot of public opinion polls, and it's been pretty consistent the last eight, eight to 10 weeks, really since kind of late March when we started tracking this. You have a percentage of the public who's saying about 25% that they're drinking more than they were pre-COVID. So they're, they're consuming more at home. You have another percentage, slightly more than that, about 30%, um, who are saying they're drinking less. They are, they're, they've reduced their consumption. And then you have a majority saying they're, they're drinking about the same. So if you were drinking four glasses of wine a week or five beers a week, whatever is your beverage of preference, you're staying about the same. So of course, media narratives form frequently. It's an easy one to latch on to, as Jim referenced, off-premise numbers, you know, convenience stores, grocery, packaged beer, packaged liquor, of course, wine and package. That has grown. Of course, it doesn't take into account for the on-premise, which has essentially been zero now for, for two and a half months. So not kind of factoring all the data together properly. It's a mixed bag, I think, in terms of personal consumption. We've seen a little bit all over the place, but the majority is staying pretty much about the same. Interesting. Um, follow up on that, if I can, Adam. I know that you run the Drink Wiser program. Does the number in the increase category cause you any concern or create any, um, any drive to do something with that? It, it does. Yeah. So, you know, you know, um, you know, one of our pillars of our CSR platform is responsible drinking. You know, we're an alcohol beverage manufacturer. We sell beer and we want to make sure our product is enjoyed responsibly. People have a good experience. People of age drink it, etc. So we've had an increased focus on moderation messaging. So we have long worked with the Ad Council and we've actually created a new campaign during the crisis. They, they developed a platform called Alone Together. Uh, as people have been stuck at home. So we created a, um, a custom moderation campaign with them that we've been pushing out. We've been hitting 10 markets with that. That's what the, the, the media budget has allowed for to date. But it's really about simple things. Hydrating between drinks, right? You're gonna have a beverage and a water, food with your beverage, uh, your alcoholic beverage, just things like that. Again, fairly basic tips, but key to remind people, particularly then they're stressed uh, and they're in a different situation. They're not getting out of the house like they, they normally would. So we have focused a lot more on our moderation messaging, which our Drinkwiser platform, which is tied to the Budweiser brand, is, is all about. Excellent. Uh, remind everybody, we have the Q&A chat open for your questions, and we do have a question from Angela. I'll put this to John. Angela is asking, are there modifications you've made to your businesses during the pandemic that you, can, that you anticipate will carry forward after companies can reopen fully? Well, for us, it's looking at additional packaging equipment, uh, certainly that would be able to produce products that are appropriate for either the retail space, the online space, Amazon, uh, or some of the hyper uh, stores. So we are go we're looking at bringing in additional equipment at this point in time. That's what, uh, you know, other than that, that's 
really it's just it's a it's taking a real serious look as to how we are balanced in terms of the products that we're producing and uh, it's it's going to definitely be people are again they're still drinking coffee they're just not drinking it where uh, where we have our strongest presence you know we do have a at least locally here in Michigan we do have or in the Midwest we do have a presence in Costco as well as some of the other uh, major uh, retail spaces but um, it's going to have to be beefed up, I will say, you know, certainly before anything happens, if this happens again later on in the year. So you really need people to get back to work. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Absolutely. We're all ready to get back, I think. You know, it's a, you know, you look at where people are drinking coffee. I mean, uh, and I'll, I was just talking to some of our distributors in Canada, and, and uh, at that time, there were approximately 25% pre-COVID who were drinking their, co their first cup of coffee at home. Now it's about 50%. So the idea that, and if they're staying at home, the idea is that we need to be able to reach those people where they're drinking the product. Yeah, Adam, anything you could add? You know, one thing we've seen certainly is the explosion in, in the e-commerce channel, right? So people are getting far more comfortable and accustomed to using services like Instacart, our case Drizzly, GoPuff, uh, et cetera. And, you know, all those I just referenced are able to deliver essentially every state alcoholic beverages. So people are getting more comfortable with that. Um, I think more accustomed to that as well. So how do you kind of meet those consumers? And then from my perspective, how do we get a chance to work with those e-commerce partners to make sure our products are being delivered uh, in a responsible manner too. So uh, it's been an explosion in e-com from our view. Uh, Jim. Yeah, similarly, we, we have our, our majority of our business is actually our soda line and our root beer. So we've been very active uh, on our Amazon uh, platform as well as our uh, online orders here where we ship out probably 30 to 40 orders a day that come through our, our door. Um, the other thing that we are is uh, besides uh, we have a, a pub and a tour center so it's really caused us to rethink all the folks that are coming through our tour center our retail storefront as they come in and how do we make sure that the proper not only <laughs> proper free COVID but now proper even more post COVID on people that are coming through off the street we have the right things and protocols in place from face masks, the hand sanitizers, to making sure people aren't touching things as they come through. Uh, part of the, 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 the you know, romanticism of a craft brewer and a craft soda company is being able to do all those things and experience all those things uh, almost in real time and the old pull the bottle off the line trick as you walk through it. You know, those kind of things won't happen as much anymore just because of some of the things that we have to do. So we have to adopt uh, different ways of bringing Well, Jim froze on us. Maybe he'll be back. Well, he uh, comes back in. We transition to another question from Greg. Greg says, I live in Chicagoland and over the last week, many beverage and liquor stores were looted or are located in neighborhoods that were attacked. This has happened across the nation. The question he wants to answer is what customer retention recommendations can you share to help beverage store chain advertising and PR staff provide assurances of store safety after their communities calm down? And I, I think, John, maybe you could address this from uh, for the perspective of the, the folks that you supply to. Well, it's a, we don't supply, this, this question doesn't, really apply to uh, my where my customers are okay. perhaps where their customers are um, we are in a very hard part of the city of Detroit um, but there has been at least in our immediate area we have not had that same type of concern at this point okay Jim any thoughts on that yeah uh, again being actively involved in a lot of different community areas and knowing our distributors and our retail partners you know the best thing we can do is you know, continue to support them where they are and, you know, kind of band together with, with the groups or the community groups that are within their neighborhood. The good news is um, in the areas at least where we are, we haven't had uh, anything too dramatic like that. Unfortunately, uh, you know, unfortunately for folks, I think it was Greg in Naperville, we haven't seen that as much, but I think the, the outreach with the folks in the communities and, um, you know, within local law enforcement or whatever, I think the more we can kind of start working together towards a common solution. Um, I think that's, that's 
probably the best recommendation we would have. And again, I've been out and about with a lot of our retail partners and is there concern? Yes. Uh, but the pre outreach is, is the best thing to do in those kind of cases. And unfortunately, I think we've seen this before where liquor stores um, are one of the places they get looted for whatever reason, I guess, because of the products that they do carry uh, more often than not. And uh, we certainly don't, you know, we, we stand with everybody to make sure that we're getting a better, getting to a better play, place and community involvement and community outreach is probably the best thing to do. Adam, maybe you have some thoughts on that from the perspective as a CSR VP. Yeah, you know, so if, you know from our, our standpoint, we have tried uh, these past week to do even more listening than we normally do. You know, we have internal employee resource groups. So our employee resource group uh, tied to the black community, the African-American community is uh, the Porter Brown Society. So we've been listening, kind of following the guidance. We have um, a company match program we call Tap at the Giving. So if if John or Jim worked for Anheuser-Busch and they each gave $100 to, a, you know, say the National Urban League, you know, we would match that contribution. And we're expediting that match right now. Usually we, we would pay out at the end of a calendar year. We're, we're paying out in real time right now. I think our, our employees know where those dollars can go. In terms of our product, we work with uh, you know 450 distributors across the country, so we're we're listening to them and trying to understand what's going on in their market. Some markets somewhat normal, some markets it's anything but normal. You know, we have curfews enforced and some very challenging situations and some situations where it might not be safe to deliver product right now. So, it's really about adapting at the local level, understanding who the local stakeholders are. I think understanding um, what each community is trying to get across. Obviously, we want to do this peacefully and respectfully, uh, but it's been leaning on our internal allies and employees, and then working with the distributors locally, again, to keep things as safe as possible when it comes to delivering our products. Certainly a difficult issue. Um, thanks for your questions, folks. Keep them coming. The Q&A chat is open. Another question, this is from Austin, and I'll put this to you, Jim. Coming out of this, do the guests, I think your customers, feel that some operators thinking of brew pubs specifically will not be able to survive as their business models have changed. In other words, they will not be able to serve on premise as much as they model. Yeah, I, it's a great question. Um, you know, you had, well, we have learned is diversification of your portfolio is so very, 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 very important. And we've been blessed that we have um, different aspects or different segments of our, our business where soda is a very big portion of that. And that has helped buoy a lot of things. And we have good presence in a lot of big box retailers where that business is actually up right now to what we talked about earlier, how are those, how are those things shifted? But um, we have been, <laughs> I, I do think that there will be some, unfortunately some craft brewers that just aren't going to make it because of the dependency on the tap room and the closures of the tap room. You can do curbside service for so long. And, you know, as you sit in a tap room, you might have one extra beer and take a, uh, you know, a, an Uber home or something like that. Whereas I don't think people are doing that. They're picking up a growler and going home. So I do think that that revenue stream from other craft brewers that I have talked to uh, has been has been a tough tough go for them right now, and I do think the landscape will shift. But I do think a lot of them will be able to shift into other areas and be able to provide and diversify into other products as well. So I think you're going to see more diversified portfolios of tap rooms as they come as we come out of this situation and into the future. So John or Adam, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I would say that as a looking at the restaurant trade where we sell coffee, many restaurants are not going to make it. And those that are going to make it, I think that, that people aren't necessarily going to be rushing back in the numbers pre-COVID. And so uh, there's going to be a very high attrition rate. And so how they are going to be consuming not just coffee, but alcoholic beverages as well is going to be greatly impacted. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a major consideration. Um, the, that idea of, of diversification, that's one of the reasons why we tried to sell throughout the country because all of these different areas are impacted in, in different ways and to different extents. So it's a matter of simply spreading risk. Yeah, to build off uh, you know, both comments, you know, I think if any business over indexes in one sales channel, when the unexpected happens, you, you could be in, in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a key learning for, for everyone who works in the beverage industry, of course. Unfortunately, it takes times like these to be reminded of that, I think, considering the last you know, 10 years or so beverage has had. I, of course, can't speak to, to John and Jim's businesses, but um, you know, we try to have a portfolio that we have 
made more varied over the years, certainly over the last decade. You know, right now, you, when you don't have people going out to restaurants, we're finding people are trading up uh, in their purchases of beverages too. And, and, and Jim can probably speak to that too. So it's a little counterintuitive with unemployment where it is right now, but people who still have disposable income want to have a different experience with the beverages they buy. So I would presume uh, to John that that pertains to at least some segments of coffee as well. So I think diversification is the key. If you're not diversified in your sales channels and your portfolio, you could be vulnerable. Any, th any thoughts on that, Jim? No, I would agree. And we, we kind of label it the, the, the affordable indulgence that people might <laughs> spend an extra dollar or two on a, on a higher end or an above premium uh, product because they, wanna, they want that feeling, whether it's coffee or beer or soda, they just want to have something that's just a little bit better, but it's not going to cost them an arm and a leg to go out and buy, you know, a, a trade up into a car is a lot different cost from a, an amount perspective than a trade up into a soda or a coffee or a beer that's a little bit higher and they just it makes them feel a little bit better. So we're seeing the same thing uh, into that um, as Adam referenced. And I think, again, the diversification of where you can be and where you can go not only on products, but on channels. Uh, for everybody is, I think it's been a good key learning and shocking because sometimes, um, I think Adam, you said it, I mean, beverage has had a pretty good run over the last 10 years. And sometimes you just rely so much on that because it just keeps coming and it just keeps coming. And sometimes you go, whoa, when is it going to stop? And now you know, right? And now you know what you need to do. And people are able to pivot quickly um, and diversify will be, they'll be all right. So Mark has a question that's related to that. His question is, before the COVID-19, I had the impression that small-scale brewers were growing around the country. Was that the case? And it sounds like maybe you think that will change. I is guess that, I'll put that to Jim. Sure. Um, they, the number of brewers were certainly gr growing. I believe uh, going into 2020, there were about 8,500 breweries as classified as breweries across the United States. So there are more and more. I would say that the beverage or the beer industry specifically was relatively flat overall as it gets more and more fragmented um, and people are looking at different ways to do it. There's a bifurcation going into big beers, big higher ABV beers and more sessionable or drinkable beers. Um, so I would say the industry overall was flat but it was just becoming more fragmented with more and more people and more and more tastes and flavors and things going out. You have um, the phenomenon of the, uh, the the hard seltzer market as well, which is included into that market. So I think, again, seeing people shift to health and wellness and flavors and things like that were also part of that number as, as to what was maybe considered growth. So it's like streaming video. We used to just have Netflix and now everybody's got their own. Uh, okay, exactly, very good. exactly. Very good. Um, John, to you, Jay has a question. Uh, he's asking if there's been any special requests from your uh, consumers or your, your customers regarding the packaging materials. Absolutely. I think that the, uh, boy, uh, where the trend has really been going toward is the legitimately, truly biodegradable uh, packaging. Specifically, I'm referring to perhaps uh, K-cups or that single serve pod. Uh, the, you know, certainly I, I can't, please don't quote me on the number or hold me to this, but it, there's enough K-cups to circle the globe several times. And that's a lot of plastic. And I think that the, the move is toward sustainable, you know, just uh, products that are going to be less impactful on the, uh, on the earth. So things that you can literally, and this is not to, uh, to be critical of my own industry. I think that, um, you know, they say that a lot of these things are recyclable. The reality is a lot of people take that packet, that pod, that used uh, cup and throw it in the trash where it's going to be there for the next 10,000 years. Whether or not it's uh, biodegradable or not, to find something that's truly going to be able to break down into inert ingredients that will be harmless and perhaps potentially helpful to the environment is the, uh, well, that's the holy grail. And when they are able to do that and do it in a way that is cost effective, um, I think that that will be a, a, a game changer for the industry. Uh, there are products out there that can, they, they claim that they can do that, but uh, I think that the, you know, for me, the, uh, the jury is still out. I'd like to see the white papers on all of that, but um, uh, it, is, it is definitely changing. You know, people are definitely tuned into how do our products have an impact on our world. 
So. And Adam, I imagine you have some thoughts on that as part of the sustainability portion of your responsibility. Absolutely. You know, as someone who grew up uh, in the great state of Michigan, it was ingrained in me at early age, that 10 cents a bottle or can deposit, you know, you recycled uh, whatever you're drinking, you know, soda, water, or you get older, you know, beer, wine. Um, you know, we, echoing John's statements, yes, consumers want to understand um, the materials that go into the packaging of the products they're consuming. We are fortunate in the beer business to not really be in the plastic business. Um, you know, certainly you've seen consumers in the last decade really shift more to cans and bottles and beer specifically. You've seen that shift and Jim probably has more insights and, and data there perhaps from his experiences, but a product like aluminum is you know, infinitely recyclable. So how then do we get that message out? How do we use our brand's platform to get that message out? How do we work with our innovation team at Hazard Bush to make our packaging more sustainable, make that clear to the consumer, get that value proposition to the consumer because it's very basic. If a consumer has two products and they feel more strongly about the sustainability proposition of a product, price the same, you know, nine out of 10 times they're gonna go with that more sustainable product because they feel better about that purchase. So it's an opportunity in the beer industry to lean into the products, uh, the recycling and the partners we have on the NGO front to help share that messaging too. So you know, part of my job is, is finding, building and maintaining relationships with, with NGO partners uh, groups like Keep America Beautiful. And Jim? Yeah, I, again, very, very similarly. I think people are asking about the entire supply chain. Um, you know, we, we do work with some co-packers on some things and on products, and one we're going to be launching here soon, but the, the amount of scrutiny that everyone goes through on where, where are the sourcing um, avenues of your products? Who does it come from? Not just from your brewery, but also from where your raw materials are coming from. I think you're going to see a shift to that as well. Um, I think you're going to see, you know, Adam is 100% right. Our can business and our root beer side is up 6x over what it was last year. And I think a lot of that has to do with people looking for a product um, that they know exactly where it came from. It gets packaged in a, a box over the can and they know no one has opened it and our draft root beer business is down, right? Obviously partly because of the, the on-premise being closed. But I do think more and more people are going to go to cans, the carbon footprint, the breakability factor, the occasion difference, that shift is absolutely real and absolutely occurring. But I think food safety through the whole supply chain uh, is what's being asked of us more and more. And I think it will be down the road as well. Just to, to build, Andy, if you don't mind, sure, you know, go something, ahead. We, something we have found when it comes to this topic is, you know, a year or two ago, it was very different meaning, you know, companies like Starbucks got a lot of pressure for plastic straws or kind of overuse of plastic um, in the materials they were using for consumers. Now in a, in a COVID and a post-COVID world, hygiene is a far different consideration. Yeah. So the fact that that plastic straw comes wrapped in plastic, you know it hasn't been touched by somebody, it's much more personal now. So instead of kind of focusing on a company like any of ours in terms of their practices, which are still very important, um, it's now from our, our research and our insights, it's becoming more personal. So hygiene in some ways is trumping um, maybe previous beliefs tied to things like plastic and straws, for instance, versus maybe how a consumer felt a year or two ago. Interesting, interesting changes. Another question from Carl related to the supply chain. He says, or he's interested to know if changes in the supply chain have maybe led to some of the increases on e-commerce that we're seeing, increase in price on e-commerce that we're seeing. Anyone? Maybe Adam, you've got an e-commerce side to your business. You think that has anything to do with it? Uh, I, I would not make that jump. Okay. Personally, I, I, I would not. Of course, we're in a supply and demand situation, right? And that's kind of changed, I think, somewhat stabilized. Certainly, as you had the shift to all packaged products versus a draft in the beer business, so brewers had to make a shift in terms of what they're able to kind of get out there too. So, you know, I, I don't want to speak in behalf of my, you know, brewing and, and procurement colleagues here at AB. Um, and of course, we don't set prices as well as, as hopefully everybody knows that the retailer sets prices for our products. Right. Yep. I would say we haven't seen that as much either. I think there's a number of factors that go into the supply chain, whether it's, uh, again, supply and demand. There's also the logistics of things getting through. The trucking industry has been under pressure uh, for years. It can't get enough drivers to bring things through and the costs of fuel and all of these things um, 
start adding up uh, quickly. And I think the, the supply chain thing is, a, is the supply chain is a fascinating thing, right? Because so many things touch it along the way and one thing can impact it immensely and everyone assumes, well, it's one thing or the other. But I think the biggest opportunity, it's, it's the supply and the, the demand side of it where we didn't know or the industry certainly didn't know COVID was going to hit the way it did and no one predicted that. So you didn't forecast maybe for what the demand was going to be. And then by the time you start catching up, there are incremental costs to expedite mm -hmm. some freight or things like that. So I would say they're all very interrelated and that it's not just one thing, but John, I don't know, you, you're shaking your head a little bit. Oh, I'm, I, I'm in agreement. Uh, you know, when I, I'm thinking of supply chain, I'm thinking from, from the farm to the ports in the countries of origin, uh, which is a concern, uh, then from the port to our shores and then from our shores all the way up, up to, uh, to our facility here. There are challenges that are literally every step of the way. Um, you know, I guess a, a, an odd blessing is a lot of these small farmers, they are, by default, they are quarantined just because they are oftentimes they're out in the middle, not surrounded by anybody. But uh, as it gets closer to the port from the countries of origin, uh, things are starting to become a little bit more problematic uh, just because, you know, the importance of social distancing. Again, in Brazil, I know Brazil has talked about closing their ports in terms of their exports. Uh, same thing with Colombia. Um, other issues that we have, I mean, if you're looking at some of the, the countries that are really landlocked, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, you know, getting, having to move their products through other countries has been somewhat problematic. There are still, though, lots, of, we have plenty of inventory at this point in time on our shores, but we are looking at potential problems down the road. But uh, today, it's not so much of an issue. There is plenty of uh, product. Just so the world can know, there's plenty of coffee here in the United <laughs> States for the time being. So. That's good to know. Um, switching gears a little bit, Caitlin wants to know, what change in your industry, positive or negative, has surprised you most through the pandemic? And we'll go back to John for this one to start. There are some, uh, without naming names, there are some major coffee roasters in America that I don't think are going to survive through this. Um, that they are going to have some, or they'll have to reorganize. Um, it's if they are too heavily weighted in the restaurant trade, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a real problem for them. So I, but I think that also I think that that's a testament to their inflexibility to be able to pivot in a large scale way. Um, but I think a lot of these smaller, more mid sized and even some of the micro roasters that they're going to have this is going to create some other opportunities. Oh, interesting. Any thoughts from Adam? Yeah, you know, for, for us, um, while being respectful of the three-tier system, for those here who know and understand the three-tier mm -hmm. system, getting our products to consumers, meaning for the whole industry, for beer as a whole, uh, more efficiently is, is a good thing. You know, you know, in beer, we, you know, we, the spirits are, of course, an option, wine's an option. So if we can get our products more easily to consumers the way they want to receive it, the way we're all getting used to receiving things, again, e-commerce being the main driver there, you know, that is a good thing. And, you know, that could still go through all our distributors as well. So. Um, kind of think the ease of delivery has been a positive change. Mm -hmm. So the three-tier system, is that a national thing or is that state by state? It is national. So that came okay. out of prohibition. Okay. Yes. So there's three. So you have the, the beverage manufacturer who sells to a distributor who then sells to a retailer. So that's a, na that's a national uh, situation. Very good. Jim, I have a, a question specifically for you hey. from, Vic from Victoria. Victoria says, you recently acquired Sprecher Brewing just before COVID hit. What additional challenges have you faced during an ownership transition in addition to COVID? How have your plans changed? Well, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, I came in as part of uh, the new leadership and ownership team on February 1st, and we started getting some great momentum going. And then um, I'll never forget the day. We, there is no blueprint, certainly, for dealing with something like this. In a, in a normal uh, operating environment where you have your legs under you a little bit. Um, I mean, the challenges have been uh, real and what it's taught us is how to uh, become even scrappier and how to take, um, take things and make them work harder for you in a very, very short amount of time. Um, and it, it allowed us to do other things where we actually redeployed all of our resources that we had, whether it was our tour center folks or retail shop folks and said, let's repaint 
the entire place. Let's redesign the entire place. So it gave us actually in some ways, how do you, it's like anything else. How do you take lemons and make lemonade out of it? Um, even though we were getting no revenue through the door directly related to our tour center, we did not uh, furlough or lay one person off, which we're pretty darn proud of. And we repainted the entire gifts, gifts shop and we rearranged things and we re recommitted to what the tour looked like we did our whole beer garden and how that looks. So now people come in now and go, oh my gosh, you guys did a lot of great things. So it, it, necessity is the mother of invention. And when you push and you really want to do the right thing uh, for people and for the environment and, and everything else, um, that it, are there times? Yeah, there are times where my, my stomach turns and it's a knots. There's no doubt about it. Um, but when, again, we, we really uh, leaned into some of that, we actually were, took the time to do some innovation as well. And we have some new innovative products coming out at the end of June into early July. Uh, so we took that time and we had the luxury of, of, of doing that in, in the short time. Hopefully it continues, uh, openings continue through the summer because, um, you know, we can't go on forever with that either given the size of our company. Uh, Victoria also wants you to know, Jim, that uh, the local alumni club is looking forward to a VIP tour tasting when Sprecher's able oh. to host us again. A Amen. We we love to have you over. We're open for business, so come on, come on by. We'll, I'll give you a personal tour. I don't know. Maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> hey, the last question on our queue here is from Esther, and queue's still open. Q and A. You can put in your question if you have one, folks. Uh, Esther would like to know how you're communicating your beverage safety initiatives to customers and consumers, especially if you've had to make drastic production change, systems changes during this time. Adam, I think you spoke a bit about this at the front end of our, our uh, talk here, but maybe you could elaborate. If there's yeah, anything more to say. No, you know, when we were fortunate is because the scale of our business and the size of our breweries and the expertise we have with the men and women who, who run our breweries and the safety protocols we've had in place for a long time. So, you know, in many ways, nothing's changed there in terms of our, our packaged products. Uh, of course, the draft business is, is essentially nothing right now. It's just starting to very slowly ramp back up. But, you know, for our bottled and canned beers and the safety that kind of goes into it and the secondary packaging that goes around that is essentially has been business as usual. Now, how do we make sure we're communicating that? How do we communicate the ingredients that goes in those beers? How do we communicate the materials that go into that secondary packaging and our primary packaging? There's an opportunity from a communications point of view, I think both above and below the line to kind of tell that story. But we've had systems in place for, for many years that, that we've kept with that, that we're proud of in terms of ensuring the safety of our, our products. Very good. And John, I think you spoke a bit about this well, safety concerns related to your uh, coffee makers and supplies that are in the office? Well, that would be more for our distributors, what we are doing personally, uh, certainly as we're receiving our coffees in. And it, for our distributors that I have through the country, it's always, it's communicated personally. Uh, but we are, as we're bringing in our, our green, uh, green coffee, our raw unroasted coffee, <laughs> that we are, we're in essence, we segregate that, we set it aside, we leave it for three days, don't touch it. After we manufacture it, after we have already put it in the packaging uh, and shrunk wrap it, getting it ready for distribution. We also let it sit an additional three days just for insurance purposes, just so it gives our distributors some peace of mind as well as ourselves. Very good. Jim, I know that uh, Wisconsin was one of the first states to start reopening bars and restaurants. And I, as you've said, your, your place is open right now for business. What kind of uh, safety communications or initiatives are you putting in place to yeah. reassure your customers? Absolutely, it's a great question. Um, you know, we have our beer garden, we have you know, the, the traditional German beer tables in our beer garden. We only have half of those tables open and we alter, we have big yellow X's on the sides of them and where people can and can't sit. And we certainly have the social distancing uh, spaces uh, all leading up to the bar. So um, you know, if you have 10 people in line, that line is a 60 foot line to get a beer uh, at our place right now, but we've also put um, you know, hand sanitizing stations along uh, all the different aspects of our brewery. We have uh, masks available for those that want to come in and wear masks if they want to bring in their own masks. We, we are not making it a requirement, but it is certainly a recommendation as people come through here. Uh, our workers and uh, during our tours have masks on, except for when they're talking. Um, you know, we have 
again, signage up that says do not touch. Um, and uh, we've kind of altered our tour just a little bit. We have, a, you know, to Adam's point, um, brewing is a very uh, clean, clean business. It's a, you, it takes a lot of hygiene to make that because you're working with living organisms. So we have a little bit of a head start against a lot of other folks where we have clean rooms and we have our filling rooms where no one's actually ever allowed in uh, unless you're fully sanitized as you go in there and our workers certainly are. Um, but our tours and our retail shops, that's where we've seen the most impact and that has the most visibility, quite honestly. Uh, you mentioned the 60 foot line. I was just imagining a line at Rick's on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> As a result that would of this. be a 60 foot line. It's going to be quite long. Uh, if we could pivot to a personal question for the three of you. The situation certainly has created multiple challenges for all of us. What's been the most challenging part for you personally? We'll start with Adam if we can. So I, I live just outside New York City. Uh, I live in a town called Montclair, New Jersey, about 12 miles outside of, of Manhattan. And I have not left Montclair, which is a pretty tiny town, since not long after I saw you in person, Andy. So you know, being <laughs> here with, with my wife and I have two young sons, and I think that the homeschooling aspect uh, that they're going through with you know, me working at home full time and kind of managing that dynamic, all of us together under one roof, versus the normal separation of kind of going out to work and school during the day, has um, now, I think like many parents and, and many of us who are working at home been the biggest challenge to, to adjust to. Very good, John. Well, uh, my wife and I were going through the process of becoming foster parents and uh, a lot of the elements of dealing with the state have come to a screeching halt. And it's, uh, it's very unfortunate because this has a direct impact on, on the kids that are stuck in the foster system. So uh, we've had to be patient as have they, as we've been trying to maneuver through all of this. And Jim, anything to share? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's, I have four children, uh, a high school daughter who's 16. And uh, I told her, I said, well, man, I said, this is great for a dad. And it's <laughs> not great for her, right? So she, you know, uh, but we've, we've, uh, we've taken the opportunity to try to take advantage of it. They're all very active kids and not being able to go to baseball practice or basketball practice or whatever practice that is. Um, I, I work two miles from this office, so I come into the, I have been coming into the office just to make sure we're supporting, and then my wife's been at home with the kids and trying to homeschool. That's created also a different dynamic, right, where I got to jump in and help probably a little bit more than I, I, I have in, in, over the course of time, but it's created different stresses for everybody, and, um, and then recently, not only the COVID side, but obviously everything that's gone on with um, the peaceful protesting and things like that, just trying to have to explain all this to children uh, I've, I found it to be quite difficult at times because I don't know what's going on half the time either. Right. All right. Well, I'm out of questions and there's no questions in the Q&A. So maybe we'll uh, offer you an opportunity for a closing comment. Yeah, we started in alphabetical order. So maybe we'll go in reverse alphabetical order, starting with Adam. Yeah, you know, it's... The beverage industry is a fascinating one to, to work in, the beer industry specifically. You know, I've worked in the beer industry for over a decade now, uh, having kind of worked in other aspects of communications prior to that. Uh, it's, I love it. You know, I think many, and, and Jim might echo this, once you kind of get into the beer industry, it's pretty hard to get out. Why would you want to get out? It's great to work in an industry where everyone knows your product and, and gets it right away. Same with John and coffee as well, of course. So um, I think adjusting with consumer trends, you know, from my point of view, I am worried every day are we evolving our csr platform in the right way are we doing it rapidly enough uh dramatic change is upon us it's going to come in terms of consumer behavior and the way consumers want companies to communicate with them and show their purpose to them so um you know part of my job now is to make sure we're we're, we're doing that in, in a perfect world ahead of the curve so i appreciate you having me and as always go green go white we go appreciate white. having you john any closing comments well, uh, that I, I have to echo what Adam said. I mean, I, I feel I've got the greatest job in the world. And uh, my wife can't believe I can't wait to go to work every single Monday. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun product. It's dynamic. It's changing every day. This, yes, this is a current situation that could really break a lot of folks but, uh, and a lot of companies. But uh, I feel very blessed to be at a company that is in a position that, that uh, is as financially sound as we are, as uh, is as as flexible as we are and has a product that is enjoyed by so many people. 
if you drink coffee and you're in the United States, you've had my coffee at some point, you just don't know it because it, we print it in so many different packages. Um, so it's a, you know, I think that because of what's going on right now, as badly as I feel for some of my competitors, it's going to create some opportunities for us as well. And uh, it's a, um, it, it's a fun, fun industry. And uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of it. And uh, definitely echo what, uh, what Adam was saying just a moment ago. Well, thank you for being with us. And I'm sure even though I didn't know what that was the best coffee I've ever had. Before I kick it to there Jim, you go. That's it. <laughs> before I kick it to Jim, I got to let you know, you have a pretty big fan base online with us today. A number of people have given you individual shout outs, including Jim from Whitefish, or uh, Angela says, shout out to Jim from Whitefish Bay. <laughs> and uh, there was another gentleman who had to sign off. I didn't catch his name, but he said, go Dukes. I suppose that means something to yeah, you. Yeah, that's our way. Yeah, it's not go Duke. It's go Dukes. That's our community-based uh, <laughs> baseball and football uh, program. So very okay. cool. Uh, thanks, Andy. Closing um, comments? Yeah, you know, I echo what these guys said. It's such a, it's a fun, it's a competitive environment. And, you know, folks that you fight with on the street every day, you can still go and have a beer or a coffee with. And those are just things, those are bonding moments in a, uh, you don't get that in every industry. And I think that's part of the, the fun of the nature, the competitiveness, and it, it always stays on the up and up and, and people really, really love their brands so much. And that's why you see so much competition. And I think it's, it's great. And sometimes I just take a step back and marvel at what's going on and trying to shift with what the consumer is. Cause it could be one thing one day and all of a sudden another thing the next. And how do you get to those points where that tipping point is? And how do you try to stay ahead of it? It's, it's a fascinating game. Well, it's been fascinating to talk to all three of you. Appreciate the opportunity to moderate this session. Um, it's been fun. Uh, it's coming up on four o'clock here, but we'll call it five o'clock in about three minutes in my house, and I'll kick it back to Meredith. Muted. You're muted. I went off video, but not off mute. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so thanks to our audience today. Um, Andy, thanks for being such a fabulous moderator. And thank you to our fantastic panel. We really appreciate everyone joining us and look forward to providing you with more Comart Side Talks in the future. Next week, we are going behind the scenes in production with alumni from news, sports, and entertainment. So it'll be a totally different twist. And so watch your inbox for follow-up email and survey and coming attractions. And we'll just leave you with the good solid go green go, go white, white go white